Today, the message is called Shine a Light, and the message is going to be about shining a light in a dark world and very specifically on the next generation. I need to preface that this message is going to, and I can teach you terminology, if you don't know what get real means. If I was talking to Gen Z crowd, I would say it's going to get real real quick. That means it's going to be, uh, well, let me tell you, it's going to be based off of tough topics, literally tough topics, and, um, well, literally. Today we're going to be talking about tough topics because I'm going to introduce to you guys a Bible club that we at Zeal have created to send kids to go into the schools with, and the Bible club is based off of tough topics. So, starting in about 15 seconds and into the rest of the service, we will be discussing very difficult topics. So if you're uncomfortable with that, or if you have someone with you that would be uncomfortable with that, that is my preface to you. Um, today's service will start with a video. When I talk to people, I describe that I grew up in two places mostly, but really three, the church, the skate park, and the beach. During the time that I was the church kid, like the very classic church kid, especially started working at the church when I was 16, and being the kid that everybody knew was always at the church, doing the music, and being up in front of people, not only as like the pastor's kid, but as like the kid who started playing music everywhere, started teaching everywhere, the whole time, I was perfectly, secretly addicted to pornography. My mom would ask me, and I remember lying straight to her face. She was like, hey, we found the stuff. Was that you? And I was like, no. And I know, like, in hindsight, I look back and I, I can see her face, heartbreak and disappointment. It gets bad. This, the addiction grabs you so tight. I would be at my friend's house and I would look up something, you know, or I'd masturbate in the bedroom when my friend wasn't there. Like I knew the whole time, you know, it ate me alive for six years. And the eating just gets worse and the secrets get worse and wrecked, absolutely wrecked my psyche. With that in my life so much, there's never a time where I looked at girls as daughters of God, you know, like never properly, never could filter that because I was addicted. I mean, I was reading, I was reading my Bible, I was praying and stuff, and fighting this with God, or at least talking to God about fighting it, keep on trying to not do it on my own strength, eventually fall until the final one. You get those thoughts. Get up, go downstairs, sneak. They won't hear you. Turn on the computer, go watch porn. I felt so like, like nasty addicted and gave in, watched it, and I went back upstairs and went back to bed, and I woke up the next morning, and a virus from the porn site had infiltrated the computer. It had this screen that was up, and it was like beeping, beep, 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 with this big white screen. You did one of these four things, and three out of those four things had the word pornography in it. And my heart was just like uncontrollably beating. So I called my dad and I said, I told him as plainly as I could, I said, I've been addicted to pornography for years. You know, as a kid, you feel like, are oh, they gonna be so disappointed in me? Like, he's gonna be so mad. And that was the opposite. He was all grace, all love. Going from those years of the addiction to no longer partaking in it and either watching or doing. That mental battle was the hardest thing I've ever gone through in my entire life. I felt like w constantly walking on eggshells, it got so bad. I literally thought that I was psychologically insane. I was just so like, there was it was like a tornado in my brain. You know, like you see in movies where there's someone by themselves freaking out, screaming, and everyone around them is normal. Like, that's what I felt like. Like, I feel like the devil just tricks you so easily to forget it is as simple as taking it away and replacing it with Jesus. So that's what I did. I started. Instead of telling myself not to think about it or to do it, I would just tell myself something about Jesus, tell myself something about the Bible. I listened to podcasts all day long. I read my Bible so much. I prayed. It just took grit and it took time. And just doing everything I can to put the right data in there, that's how I replaced it. Over time, God has healed me tremendously. 
it really is chasing after Jesus and then naturally like he he deals with it through us as we do that and I learned that anxiety is like my new my new battle that I'm facing now and it's the same answer daily I have to just pump Jesus into my life and now I pastor kids who go through that and every other struggle in the book and like Jesus said it's one day at a time don't worry about tomorrow because it's got enough evil Jesus isn't just this weird churchy guy like he is real and he really does work in your life simple as that Teens today struggle with some of life's greatest struggles and greatest challenges. Life's, like all ages. They're struggling with them at increasing rates and increasing intensities. And there is a time now, more than ever, unlike ever before, to shine a light on some of these tough topics. Only in Jesus Christ is there true love, healing, and growth. I was one of those kids, and I had no idea how to talk about it. And the devil grabs you, and he makes you think that you're alone. I'm going to read some mainstream stats and quotes about struggles that kids are going through today. The reason that these are mainstream is so that you don't get the impression that I'm just a pastor saying, hey, my kid over here is self-harming, cutting themselves every day. My kid over here is wanting to commit suicide, or they have two friends that commit suicide, or this kid is stressed out of their mind, or I have these kids that can never stop being anxious all day long about everything. I'm not the one saying that. The world says that. The world is pointing out that these kids are struggling unlike humans have ever struggled before because we're in a new world that we've never experienced before and it's new for them. Let me preface also, it's a change for you. This technology and stuff is a change for you, but it's totally new for them. It's, it's not, not new, it's normal for them. 62% of teens say they know who they are, while 37% do not fully know their identity yet. Technology and social media may prove finding identity even more confusing and difficult, giving us more possible versions of self than ever before to constantly edit and an endless supply of people to compare ourselves with. We may risk a vicious cycle of seeking constant online approval, causing unhealthy online dependency or a misconception that online identity equals real life. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 24. Rates of ages 10 to 19 increased 56% between 2007 and 2016, not to mention the past three years. One in six high schoolers seriously considered it in the past year. One in 12 attempted, and four out of five teens who attempted gave clear warning signs. Teens on electronics five hours a day are 71% more likely to have suicide risk factors than those on one hour a day. 157,000 of those ages 10 to 24 are treated in the ER for self-inflicted injuries every year. Those who self-harm range from 13% to 24%. That's about from eighth grade to 12th grade. 90% of them begin during their pre-adolescent or teen years, and 50% of them start around age 14 and carry on until their 20s. Types include cutting, banging, burning, piercing, and more. 32% of teens will meet criteria for an anxiety disorder, but 80% of them won't get treatment. The typical age for anxiety to seriously develop is 13. Types of anxiety include separation, phobia, social panic, or general anxiety. At age 13, 53% of girls are unhappy with their bodies, growing to 78% by age 17. 95% of people with eating disorders are ages 12 to 25. 50% of young people admit to cell phone addiction. 81% of teens feel social media has a positive effect on their lives, but dangers of our use of it include, and these are based off of stats and quotes that I pulled, loneliness, anxiety, depression, predatory activity, unrealistic expectations, poor sleep, stress, isolation, jealousy, and decline in mental health, physical health, self-esteem, happiness, and face-to-face -face interaction. 11 is the average age a child is first exposed to pornography, and I have heard way lower for average ages. 
93% of boys and 62% of girls have watched before age 18, 22% of those being under the age of 10. To be above reproach, these stats and quotes are from Stage of Life, Chandra Jones, or Johnson, Mary Madden, Solstice, RTC, Kids Data Bank, Myself, Jacqueline Howard, Jason Foundation Incorporated, The Refuge, Samantha Gluck, Mental Health America, Crisis Sex Line, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, Child Mind Institute, Evolve Treatment Centers, Heather Galavan, Do Something, Trisha Hewson, Kit Smith, Jane O'Donnell, Sherry Rudowski, Anya Zakova, Jessica Brown, Alive Walton, BP Magazine, Enough is Enough. And this still has nothing to say of how students are dealing with stress, racism, loneliness, and other tough topics. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and give this preface right now, um, before that, Linda. I wanna preface to you guys, these stats and quotes are not considered absolute truth, nor will we say that ever, in case you weren't here for the beginning or in case you don't remember. We are going to take mainstream stats and quotes in order to present to the world through public school system these tough topics. This is what the world says about you guys dealing with this. A kid's gonna go into a school and be able to do that. And then we're gonna give the Bible's response to it. But at no point do we ever claim that this is absolute truth, that all these stats are absolutely on point. But the magnitude, intensity, and consistency of this information screams of a need to address it. Also, before that list, I decided to print out, um, actually, yeah, go ahead and put the list up. These are the 25 tough topics that we are gonna go and hit public school system with and bring up. This is not the extensive list of what students are struggling with today. But it's 25 of them, and we've done research on, I've done research on all of them to pull the stats and quotes from the mainstream on presenting each subject and it's described in a summary paragraph. The second half of the paragraph is the biblical response to each tough topic. This is online at the website at the bottom of the bulletin on zlccf.com and tough topics. You can click each one to have the summary and you can also scroll down for all the stats and quotes and then scroll down even more and get all of the Bible verses related to each tough topic. It's also been compiled into this booklet. Every page has the topic, including John 3.16, which is the gospel, because kids don't know that and then different Jesus quote on each page because he's the solution, he's the light, which we're gonna talk about, and then the summary paragraph. I'll tell you a little bit more at the end about practically how the Bible Club works, but that is what we're gonna do, and we're gonna hit these 25 tough topics in order to shine a light on them because kids are struggling with them. I did a survey in Zeal, which is our student ministry, middle school and high school last week. Tommy helped me figure out this. I see some of the homies are in here. Here's the, middle, or the high school, the top five I'll start with the top one on both, middle and high school. The top one that was given a response, that kids didn't write zero, they wrote something. And we have the average intensity to the scale of 10, 10 being the worst. The number one on both middle and high school for kids is stress. There it is, on the bottom right there, stress, number one. For high school, the other in the top five included failure, anxiety, loneliness, and cell phones. Thanks for being honest, high schoolers. And middle school, stress, number two was anger. Number three was forgiveness. Number four was failure. Number five was family and home life. And loneliness was not too far on that one too because that is a very common thing as well. Thank you for the list. That's just our zeal kids. I just wanted to compare all the world's stats and quotes to our kids and it's really not that far off. We as Christians have a responsibility to address this information because of the magnitude, intensity, and consistency of the information. And it's hard to catch up with how the next generation is playing out with this new world. It's hard to, to play catch up with how the effects of this new world or what the effects are. But a Christian has a responsibility to respond. And how do we respond? Very simply, with this guy which last night I had to open it up because they were like, what is that? All those cool stickers. It's a Bible, by the way. <laughs> the Bible is our, it's the cool looking Bible. You're welcome. The Bible is a Christian's way to respond to the tough topics and the difficult challenges that anyone faces 
especially this next generation. Let me also preface now, I'm gonna be talking about the next generation. I know that you guys have struggled with this stuff too and, you, and some of you probably still do. The, the message is not just about the next generation. Following, starting now, after I give you this Bible definition that I'm gonna give them, it relates to all of us, but we have a responsibility to them. Here's the definition that they get in the booklet and um, I don't know if it's online. Here's the definition of the Bible. I'm gonna try and do it in two breaths. I can't do it in one breath. I've tried a lot. Here we go. <clears throat> you ready? Definition of the Bible. Because, by the way, we have to preface what the Bible is. You can't just roll into a public school and say, hey, the Bible says all this stuff. And the kids are gonna be smart, because they are, and they're gonna be like, well, why do I care about the Bible? So here's the definition of the Bible. The word Bible is from the Greek tabiblia, which means the scrolls or the books, and was written by God through over 40 human authors of different backgrounds, professions, and ethnicities over the span of about 1,500 years in three languages on three continents, totaling 66 books and multiple genres with hundreds of topics. But the one theme that God loves us and through Jesus Christ offers eternal life and forgiveness of sins that whosoever would believe in him would be saved from sin and death and called to live their destiny on earth and in the eternal paradise of heaven with God forever. Second Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.21, and other scriptures is where we as Christians are told that the Bible claims to be the word of God, not a bunch of human opinions. So either this thing is legit or it's not. As Christians, we believe it is. As Christians, we believe it's the word of God. So this is what we use to shun a light in a dark place, in the dark place. So let's talk to the Bible, okay? Let's get a fresh, clear, simple perspective on how the Bible introduces the world, how it talks about the world, what it says the problems of the world are, and how the problems in the world are supposed to be solved and fixed. First question, the, main, the message is called Shine a Light, so if you have a conversation with the Bible, uh, Drew, I'll act like you're the Bible. Hey, Bible, what is the light? Well, Drew, as the Bible would say, wrong question, who is the light? Spoiler alert, Jesus is the light. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Leave that there for a sec. Can you tell me the opposite of light? Darkness. Can you tell me the opposite of life? Death. Okay, so we start to see from Jesus claiming to be light and light of life that the Bible is using terminology of light and life and also, therefore, darkness and death. And we also see that in Luke 1, 78 to 79, where Zechariah prophesies of his son, John the Baptist, about Jesus, saying, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. It's funny how shadow and death are acquainted. So death is in relation to shadow, which is darkness. So there we go. Boom. The Bible uses that terminology that life equals light. And darkness equals death. This is important for us as Christians to understand and for anyone that isn't a Christian to learn. This is the way the Bible describes the world. Through the terminology of light and life and darkness and death. We need to understand this because we live in a dark world which I know that you guys understand, no matter what your age is. Gen Zs, I'm looking at you, I see you. Pay attention. We live in a dark world. Why? Simple explanation the way that the Bible describes it. We have to understand the simplest definition. Why is the world dark? Why does the Bible use light and life, darkness and death? The world is dark because Sin equals, say it, darkness. darkness. Sin equals darkness. Why? Thanks for asking. That was a Danny Hodges moment. You're welcome. All the older people are like, I got you. This is the world. It's a good looking world. Thank you. Romans 3.23 is a very complicated verse. It says everybody sinned. And as long as you are a human being, you know that. This is a representation of all of you dirty little sinners. <laughs> this will be me right here, not next to you. Okay, so here's all the dirty little sinners. So the world is full of sinners because everybody sinned. 
Sin is darkness. Why? Because Romans 6.23, later on in the book, it tells us the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Start to see the loop. Leave that up for a sec. The wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. So because of sin, we experience death. In case you didn't know, that's why all humans die, because all humans sin. Sin, first of all, is not just our actions. It's not just that we are a sinner because we sin. A really smart guy said it like that. You are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. Let it sink in. I'll say it again. You are not a sinner because you sin. I don't do this many sins and suddenly, whoops, I guess I'm a sinner. You start to sin because you are born into sin. That's the way the Bible describes it. You are born with this curse. I tell the kids, if you've seen Moana, it's kind of like you see the black curse climbing into the island and attaching itself to the island. That's what sin is on our life. We are born with it. We're cursed with it. The first humans God ever created sinned against him. And sin simply is anything that is outside of the will of God, the plan of God, the original design of God, anything outside of that, that is sin. Anything you think, say, do, etc. And the payment for sin, just like when I steal a car, I have to fine or I have to go to jail. Something like that. Same thing with God. He plays fair. You sin, you have to pay the price, but the price is death, and not just death of your body. The Bible describes that very clearly. There's a second death, eternal damnation, being cursed for eternity, separation from God, which is heavy. Hashtag tough topics. Sin and death are our two greatest problems for every human. Every single human's two greatest problems are that you're a sinner and you're going to die, and those are the two things that you have to get fixed if you want anything other than eternal damnation forever against the eternal God that you have sinned against, which is why death in eternity is eternal because you sin against an eternal God. It says here that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's gift is life to a world of people full of sin, therefore a world of people full of death, therefore a world that is dark. That is why the world is dark, because it's full of sinners and it's full of death, and sin and death equal darkness. Sin and death are our two biggest problems. So, thank you. We have two options. Number one, we deal with our sin and we pay for that ourselves in eternity, which is not fun. The second option is you find some other human, because you're a human, to live a perfect life, because you haven't, and then you have a little conversation with them and you say, hey, listen, so I know that you've been on perfect and everything and that's great. Can you actually sacrifice all of that perfection and give that to me? And can you take all my dirty junk? That'd be great. You know, just, I don't know what you want to do with it, but figure that out. I just want to have your perfection. Either way. So even if you convince them to do that, boom, cool. You get your sin taken care of. You also either have to find that same person or another person who is strong enough, and I don't know any human that is, to defeat death. Now, everyone do this with your hands and do this. Okay. 10 out of 10 people die. There's a statistic that just blew your mind. You're welcome. <laughs> So, good luck finding a human that can defeat death, and even if you do, you have to convince them to take care of your death problem, because you're going to die. Funny enough, that's exactly what Jesus did, and you don't have to convince him. His incredible love for you, which is outside of your pathetic little box of understanding, he came to die for you to pay for that sin and to give you eternal life. That's the gift that God gives to the world, full of death and darkness, without you even asking. Let that sink in for the rest of your life. God loved you that much. Ephesians 1.7, in him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The blood's talking about the? The blood is talking about the? Thank you. Cross? It's through the cross, which is a big thing. That's a whole other series of messages. It's through the cross that Jesus, being a perfect human, died on that cross. That perfect human sacrifice is now able to pay for all the other imperfect humans because his was perfect, and he offered it as a sacrifice to the human race. The cross 
the blood is the payment for that. Ephesians 1, 7 and other Bible verses say that's what Jesus did. Boom. First problem, sin, check, taken care of in Jesus. Also, second problem, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believed in him would never perish but have what? Eternal what? Which means that because Jesus not only died but also rose from the dead three days later, he defeated death. He died, and then three days later, he was like, you know what, I'm kind of getting sick and tired of this whole death thing, and you know what, death, I can beat you in an arm wrestle, so I'm just going to get up. That's kind of what he did. I mean, he did some stuff in that whole three-day period. You can ask Dad about that later. But, and whose strength did Jesus get up in? Yes, I heard someone say it. Specifically, his own. Yes, God's is the correct answer, but more specifically, his own. His own strength, because Jesus is God. If you want Bible verses to prove that, I'll give them to you later. Jesus is God. God became a human, and then through the power of the Holy Spirit, lived that human life, and then after he died, that same power of that spirit was able to raise him from the dead. Those three parts, triune God. There is your theology for the day. You're welcome. Jesus had the Holy Spirit because he's God, and he's like, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to defeat death because death can't hold me down. There's a Bible verse for that. Death did not hold him down. Death holds us down, but not Jesus. He took care of both of our problems. The result, perfectly summarized in Romans chapter 8, Verse 1 to 2, therefore, after everything we said, after all of that, therefore, there is now no condemnation, which means you're not damned in hell for eternity. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives what? Life has, say these three words, set you free from the law of what? Sin and death. So you are set free from your two greatest problems. Can I get a yo? Jesus did that. Two problems gone. You're set free. That's big. Nine o'clock service, test. Last night they didn't shout it out. Why are we set free? Who knows a Bible verse? We're set free to live what? What? Thank you. We are set free for freedom itself. Galatians 5.1 is what says that. It is for freedom you are set free. The reason that we are set free from our sin and death, which is bondage to us, is so you can live free. Why does that make sense? I tell the kids, it's kind of like Toy Story, where Buzz Lightyear saves uh, the green guys, and they're like, you have saved our lives, we are eternally grateful. <laughs> it's kind of like that. A little bit more on the serious side, but it's kind of like that. Where God saves us, and now it's like, okay, I'm yours, let's go. You save me from sin and from death. I'm, I'm, you're my master. I'm going to follow you. But it's, more, it's deeper than that. Because in time, or outside of time, at some time, God took time before your time. I just had to keep on going as long as I could. But he did. He took time before your time, okay? Before you were born. Let it sink in that God lets us name each other, okay? So he lets us have the responsibility of giving the other people names, like mom and dad. But he knew our names before we were born. And he took some kind of significant amount of time to think just about you. And write out every step of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year of your life a plan, a purpose out. I don't know what the book looks like. I don't know if he used liquid gold for ink, or maybe that's too cheap. Sorry, God, no disrespect. <laughs> My bad. But whatever it looks like, it, the Bible says, here's two verses and there's a bunch of them, but the Bible says, hmm, Ephesians 2.10, Psalm 139.16, and if you want more, I'll get them for you later. All over the Bible, especially those two, that before you were born, God prepared something for you, specifically for you. Again, let that sink in for the rest of your life. He took some significant amount of time to write out the plans for you. Not that you are to be all nitpicky like, oh, if I don't take the right step, I'm not going to be in God's plan. Oh, my goodness. No, that's not the point. The point is God thought of you, and God made a plan for you. And what he wrote out was not what you were going to do. He wrote out what he wanted you to do. 
the plan all along that he has for you. Knowing everything ahead of time so that when you are set free from sin and death, you can live out that plan. That's why you're set free. I'm set free so I can live free. Free to live what? Free to live my purpose. That's written. Free to live my destiny. That sounds like a Marvel movie. Super epic. But it's totally real. And you know what? Kids, this generation, need to hear that more than anything else. There is a purpose and there is a destiny for your life. And that's not cheesy. It's totally serious. God has a written out purpose, plan, destiny for you to live out once you are set free from your sin and death, once you give your life to Jesus, because through Jesus you do that. Jesus is the light. This is the light that we have to go into the world with, the message of Jesus, because he sets us free from sin and death, and he gives us the freedom now to live out the purpose and destiny that we've had sitting for us the whole time, that we can always go back to. Again, another message. You can always go back to it. God's always waiting for you. Jesus said, now you're the light of the world. You are the light because now I'm inside of you. Now that you believe in me, you go be the light. And what he told Paul in Acts 26, it's to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God. If you're not under, under the power of God, you're under the power of Satan. That's what the Bible says. Either the Bible is true or it's not. So that's what the Bible says about the light. Now the question is, how do we shine a light? Practically, how do I shine a light? Three pieces of, I almost did two, of advice that the Bible gives us and that we see in Jesus, because he's the light, so we learn from him. Three. Number one, advice on how to shine a light. Know your Bible. Know your Bible. There are at least 10 accounts that I found just in a little bit of research where Jesus quotes of their day the Bible, which is the Old Testament. That was their Bible. 10 accounts in the Gospels. I got them all listed right here. If you want them, I'll get it to you. Where he quotes the Bible in talking to someone. There's also an account where he opens up the scroll, and it says he finds the place in Isaiah. Sick, right? Jesus knew his Bible. He knew his stuff. Example, we ought to know our Bible. We ought to know our stuff. Why? Why? Okay, Gen Z, because they are growing up in a world that is continually growing with endless information at the fingertips. Endless information. I had, listen carefully, Two conversations, and I think they were both middle school students, maybe one high school, with Zeal kids in the past week, where they were telling me something, some new profound piece of knowledge. And I was like, yeah, where'd you hear that? And they said, I saw it on a YouTube video. There is so much information being pumped into their brains every single day. You can't fathom it, not like they do. And they can't fathom it. And it becomes increasingly difficult for them to decipher and filter out what's true. And they're being taught also, you're being taught, but they're growing up being taught, that truth is relative. America is telling them truth is relative. Listen to how nice this sounds. Hey, Amen. Listen, bro, what's true for you is true for you, right? But what's true for me is true for me. So listen, you believe what you want to believe. I'm going to believe what I want to believe. And, you know, let's talk about it, you know, good conversation, that's love, man. But, like, don't be, don't be too crazy with your opinions, you know, chill out, just, like, respect my opinions, I respect yours, we'll coexist, we'll be tight, all right, that's cool, right? You just believe what you want to believe and we'll both be all right, we'll both get to the same place. See how subtle that sounds? That's a normal conversation, downtown, having coffee with someone, or meeting someone at the smoothie bar. Not to mention the thousands, thousands of pieces of data being pumped into their brains every day. How are they going to know what the truth is? They're going to see it on a YouTube video, and that's not a joke. So you have a responsibility. Don't you dare call yourself a Christian unless you know your Bible. I tell the Zeal kids the same thing. I treat them as adults. I say, don't come in here and say that you're a Christian if you're not going to be legit and be hardcore. You need to be punk rock. If you're not, 
don't say you're a Christian. If you don't know yet, if, you don't, if you're not feeling it, if this is too weird for you, you just want to come and hang out, that's fine. Tell us. We're cool. We're still going to love you. Let's still play games and have fun. But once you say you're a Christian, act like it. Nobody likes a poser. And you have a responsibility, just like me, to that generation beneath us to know our Bibles because we are not to just tell them, oh, this is my opinion. This is how you live your life, Mr. and Mrs., little one. Why? Because the Bible says it right here. Because the light, Jesus, also claimed to be the truth. John 14, 6. He said, I'm the light, but he also said, I'm the truth, which is a huge statement. In John 17, 17, he said, your word is truth. So either Jesus is the truth and this thing is the truth, or it's a load of garbage and none of you should be wasting your time here. You should be at Chris and Cousins. The people who laugh know Chris and Cousins. How many universal truths are there, fam? Hold it up with your hand if you know. How many universal truths? How many universal, thank you, Zeal. How many universal answers to every question is there? I'm not talking math where there might be like, you know, five different answers, whatever. In life, there is one answer to every single question you could ever ask. Whether or not you ever get that answer is not up to me. Are we all a part of the dream of a cheetah? I don't know. But if we are, that's the truth. Or there's a divine God who's created all of us and loves us. There is one answer for truth. They're not being told that. They're being told truth can be anything. Truth can be whatever you make it, man. Just be happy. Don't even get me started. Happiness is one of the top things declining in the next generation as they're being told, live your life to be happy. Here's a bunch of toys. Here's more screens. Mm, I'm not going to go. Second thing. This is really complicated, by the way. I'm warning you. You laugh because you hate doing that. Can you guys see that? It says talk to people. Talk to people. Listen carefully, okay? I am, I don't mean this disrespectfully, I am in between most of you and the Gen Zs. You that are older than me grew up in a world where that might be more normal. And therefore, I'm not trying to teach you as parents or whatever, therefore you may expect something of the kids that they have no idea. Because talking face to face with someone might be normal for you and it's actually very strongly pushed in the Bible. A couple verses on that is, 2 John 12, where John writes, I don't want to just finish this letter. That's why it's one of the shortest. Actually, 2 John is the shortest, I think. He says, I'm, I'm going to stop writing this letter because I want to see you face to face. And also Paul. No, sorry. <laughs> Hebrews, don't know who wrote it. But someone in Hebrews said, don't stop meeting together. Keep on meeting together face to face. Because, in many other verses, where the Bible pushes, face to face interaction is what we are designed for. It's what we need. But there is a decline in face to face interaction with this next generation coming up. They think, Gen Z's, I love you, you're with me, but they think that it is completely normal and okay to live the majority of their entire social life locked in their bedroom with this. They think that's okay. They think it's normal because that's what they've grown up with. And Christians are not the ones saying anything. The mainstream, all the stats and quotes I got, and I'll give them to you if you want them, the world, non-Christian world, points out that kids are declining in mental and physical health and in face-to-face -face interaction because this is not enough for their social lives. It's not enough. The mainstream notices that the human race is built for something more than that. But it's normal for them. And you are the example. And I am the example. When someone hurts your feelings, you go and look them dead in the face and you say, you hurt my feelings. And the other person looks them dead back in the face and listens. That's what the Bible says, right? 
Simple, right? Easy. <laughs> no, never. They still got to learn that. Face-to-face -face interaction is declining, and talking to people is one of the greatest ways to be a light. You be the example to them about face-to-face -face talking with people. Look someone dead in the face and tell them you love them. You shouldn't start a relationship with a phone. Zeal, listen carefully. <coughs> Nor should you end a relationship with your phone. Nor should you depend on a relationship with your phone. Kids have 500 friends on Facebook and 1,000 followers on Instagram, and then someone in their family dies and no one's sitting next to them. Be the example to them. They need that. God's designed us for that. They're getting sucked into the technological world. Third thing, also complicated, heads up. You can back me up on this one. Pray. You're a Christian. You should pray. Don't even get me started on a rant on all of you non-Gen Z adults. If you call yourself a Christian and don't spend time praying by yourself, you should be ashamed. Pray by yourself. Pray for people. Spend five seconds off your phone and pray for someone. And pray with people. Forgive me for forgetting that Jesus was the example in talking to people. He talked to thousands. He talked to hundreds in his disciples. He talked to his 12 apostles. He talked to Peter, James, and John, and he talked to John. Every level, Jesus is our example of that. He's also our example in praying. He prayed by himself, and I think there's more Bible verses about him praying by himself than anything else. Let that sink in for your own Christian life. And he prayed for people, and we see that throughout also. Paul, almost every letter he writes, every letter he writes, he says, hey, I've been praying for you. You can't write that unless you've been doing it. And he prays with people. Jesus prayed with people all the time, and I teach this in zeal, right? Back me up. When someone walks into the room and they got a down, down face, downcast face, do not bust a super cliche American or Christian churchy, how's it going? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Or worse, I'm okay. Oh, man, hey, well, good to see you. <laughs> Have a nice day. No. What do we do, Zeal? You say, hey, can I pray for you real quick? I'm looking at kids over there that have done that for me. I'm looking at one kid over there that did that for me about this message three days ago. He said, hey, I feel like God told me to pray for you. I was like, sick. So we stopped right there. This kid's running around and screaming, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he prayed for me. That was rad. You need to be, yeah, amen. You need to be the example as well. You need to have a prayer life, and if your prayer life is legit, then the kids that are going to be looking up to you are going to know it without you saying anything. But it also will mean a lot when I look like I look at the Zeal kids and I say, I've been praying for you by name. They know that I mean it. Also, make sure you pray for people, and even more specifically, pray with people. Piece of advice. We see it in Jesus all the time. Pray with people. You can take 10 seconds and change someone's life by stopping what you're doing, showing them that your life isn't all about you and that you actually care enough to lay a hand on their shoulder, because the Bible says it, and throw a quick prayer at them. Or ask for prayer. Ask the kids to pray for you. If you got something going wrong in your life, ask a kid to pray for you. I wish I had time to tell you stories of the things that God has done in Zeal's life. These are the three things that we can use to shine a light. These are also the three ways that we will use Zeal Bible Club, which is what it's called, to go into the public school system and shine a light in some of the darkest places. Because, final point, it says about Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Did you know, and if you didn't, you probably did, but here's a reminder, Darkness does not defeat light. I don't care how dark the room is. When you put a light bulb and light it in there, it doesn't matter how thick the darkness is, the light bulb is going to win every time. Amen. Funny enough, 
It's the same thing with Jesus. So when I send a zeal kid into their public school, they're going to have the foundation of Zeal Bible Club being the Bible. Everything they read is, hey, here's the mainstream stats and quotes of presenting the subject, but here's what the Bible says about the subject. And if you have any other questions that I don't know, here's the information on how to get the answer biblically. It's all based on the Bible. Secondly, every week... The church supports by buying pizza, so we'll buy them pizza, we'll give them stickers, we'll give them pens, we'll give them pop sockets, I already got them ordered, we'll make it sick. That's what it's all about. So that they can get together, be stoked, have pizza, read the paragraph, and then discuss. What do you think? Amen. And then, let that go on. We're talking 25-minute lunch session. I did this all year at Gibbs last year, which is right over there, by the way. It's St. Pete's right over there, and <clears throat> someone's going to go and do a ZBC in St. Pete. Represent, I see you over there. Point three... After you talk, hey, so abuse was a topic for today. Stress was a topic. Pornography, suicide, self-harm, family home life. Are you struggling with that topic, or is there someone that you know struggling with that topic? Are you struggling with abuse, or you know someone that is? Are you struggling with family home life, or you know someone that is? Are you struggling with suicide, or you know someone that is? Step forward. Let's all pray for you real quick. 60 seconds, if that. Or you get more than one kid to pray. Two minutes, three minutes. And then afterwards, hey, we got more time. Any other prayer requests about your family, about your grandma, about your sister, about your brother? Sure, let's pray for it. Boom. And then before you know it, session's over. Any kid can start any club they want. We give them the resources to do a Zeal Bible Club. They will be able to meet once a week during the lunch so that they can invite all the kids from the school. And once a month, we can go and do hashtag kill the noise with Ryan Reese. Our version of that, which is called Shine a Light, where we go and invite the whole school and shine a light on some of these tough topics with the intention that kids' lives are changed. ZBC, Zeal Bible Club, is devoted to the love, healing, and growth of one another through bringing some of life's toughest topics into the light and seeing what the Bible says about them. Our desire is for students to grow in community through authentic discussion. Our hope is for every student to find their life's worth and purpose in a relationship with God through Jesus, who offers forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We want kids' lives to be changed. A video that summarizes all of this in about three minutes is coming right here. Thank you. You are not hidden. God and you are not hopeless Though you have been broken Your innocence stolen I hear you whisper Underneath your breath I hear your rest So is your rest So
kids and their lives are changing. <laughs> Jesus is real, man. Amen. Can you guys stand with me real quick? Forgive me for overtime, man. I just want to do this for like 60 seconds. I want to do Latin style prayer. Can we all just pray? If you're not comfortable with whatever, just like 30, 60 seconds and I'll end it. A Latin style means everybody prays at the same time out loud. And pray for this next generation. You guys know your responsibility. I know my responsibility. And I know we got these struggles too sometimes. It's a whole different world for them. Just 30 seconds or so. Uh, on the count of three. One, two, three. Lord, we need you, Jesus. We need you, and I pray that you would shine a light in this next generation, that you would shine a light in our lives and use us to take the light to the darkest places and that we would pass the baton on to this next generation, that they would come up and be brighter than we ever were, the brighter that we could ever imagine them to be, Lord. Take the love that only comes from you and shine it in this world in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great day.